Hello and welcome to the Japan Archives, a podcast where we'll be delving into the histories and mythologies from Japan's long history. I'm your host, Thomas. And I'm your co-host, Heather. We'll also be reading a poem for you every week and giving a little history about the poet who wrote it. Ikimashou! To the Japan Archives. We're on episode 36, and today we're going to talk about rice. So, Thomas, before we get started, how are you today? I am doing good. Tomorrow is my first day back at school. Um, the kids won't be there. It's just like a meeting the day before to get our new schedules and things. So, looking forward to getting back into that routine. Uh, what about you? I am doing good. It's a nice sunny day. It's your weather report. It's going to be, oh, I always forget the Celsius, but it's going to be slightly warmer today, a nice spring day. Um, I think the cherry blossoms have bloomed here. I think they were a little bit behind Tokyo, but it's a nice day. Thank you. And also before I start on what I have to say, Thomas, what can you tell me about rice? I think there's two different types of rice, isn't there? There's white rice and black rice okay what what else you got for me obviously it's grown in rice paddies i think in japan a lot of the rice is like homegrown but honestly that's about it for the actual history of rice i don't know too much really okay so you, you know a little bit about rice that's good i you mean a tiny bit a tiny a, a small grain of rice worth of knowledge so do you like rice i do but i don't eat it too often and when i do it's more in not really japanese food like thai green curry and things like that or if i do go to the um conveyor belt sushi restaurants then i'll have rice but i seldom cook it for myself in a japanese dish so yeah i mean that's a a lot of people i think in like european and american areas we don't eat rice too often we eat it occasionally maybe with like you know chinese food japanese food or spanish and mexican food and also like you said thai so we eat it when we eat different different dishes but generally we don't eat it so often i want to tell you a little bit more about rice now when i started doing the research for this i knew i knew it i knew some things before but then like really doing more in-depth research. There is so much information. I just am going to share a few things today and we might see rice again. We'll probably see it in other stories. We might see it as part of history. Rice has had a long tradition here and in other Asian countries as well, but we'll just do a few little things today. So first of all, I did want to tell you what is rice. Rice is a grass which uh, that surprised me. I did not realize it was actually a grass. It's the product as well as the plant. So you have a rice plant and the actual product is, is rice. It's a cereal grain. And the scientific name, you might have to help me with the Latin. <laughs> Oriza sativa. Yeah, Oriza sativa. Okay, I like your pronunci- Your pronunciation sounds better than me, so. Okay. It's, it's usually grown in a water patty. But you know what? It really doesn't need the patty to grow. So you can find rice growing naturally just in fields away from water sources. You've probably seen this. Like, I mean, I see this over the like the fall and winter when you're walking outside after the rice has been harvested, the field's been drained, the rice has been harvested. You'll see the plants kind of growing back. They don't have the water at that point. They're just like the the leftover rice or I guess what didn't get harvested or it just regrows. But yeah, you actually don't need it. But I think most places, at pretty much most places, I'm sure there's some places that don't have it, but around the world, it is grown in, in water because it helps to ward off bugs and other rice predators and it waters the rice and it does actually generate more rice per field. So you'll get a more bigger harvest if you use the water. Rice takes a lot of water (laughs) to grow. Now it started in beds, like the actual plant is grown in beds, and then it's moved to the water paddy when it's about 25 to 50 days old. So it's it's grown separate area and then moved. So you've probably I don't know, have you 
been able to go to like a rice paddy and see before they actually start planting, like just the water sitting in the field. Yes, there's a lot of them right now waiting to be planted. Like a lot of just empty fields. I do like this time of the year when it's just like a sea of water wherever you drive around. It's always quite pretty to see. Oh, at sunset when the when the sun is starting to go down. Oh, that's gorgeous. So here rice isn't usually grown in like the tiered patties. Like you'll see a lot in like in, in China, you'll see a lot of the tiered patties. Usually here it's kind of flat fields, but there is a spot in Chiba that does have that tiered patty. It's gorgeous. Definitely recommend going there. So you mentioned different types of rice. Well, because I didn't want to do too much information, but there are different kinds of rice, uh, but I didn't focus on that for this topic today. There are two different ways to process rice or like polishing, because when you harvest the rice, you, you can't just eat it. It's got a hole on the outside. Now you'll need to polish that rice to remove the hole to be able to eat it. There are two different varieties you can get from the one rice plant. You have brown rice, which is genmai. It is has that, that hole on it. It's more chewy. It's more nutty. It has more nutrients. And then if you keep polishing, you can get white rice. White rice has had the hole removed, and it's the polished and white looking. The brown rice has that brown appearance. It's healthier. And nutritionists always recommend to eat it. But... White rice is more popular. It does have less nutrients, but it's way more delicious. If brown rice is healthier, why do they polish it until it's white as opposed to keeping it in its more nutritious state? Well, my, my personal opinion, and I'd probably have to verify this, white rice is more delicious. <laughs> I mean, do you like brown rice? Yes. You do? Okay. I, mm -hmm. I'm okay with brown rice, but if you put... A bowl of white rice and a bowl of brown rice. The brown rice is softer. It has like that really nice flavor. The brown rice has a stronger flavor to it. White rice is kind of more more subtle and it's a lot more chewier. It also takes longer to cook. I think, I mean, I'm I'm good, good. I'm glad you like brown rice. I like it sometimes, but usually with stuff like mixed together, like a like a pilaf or something. We're not just eating brown rice. But yeah, and the the whole brown rice. Yeah, doctors, especially people who are trying to lose weight here. The doctor, I do know I had someone I knew um, last year who had to, Japanese person, he had to decrease his kilos. And the doctor said, eat less rice or don't eat rice at a meal. So he would not eat the rice. <laughs> and he was kind of sad. Um, but you can also eat less brown rice too. So in Japan, the majority of rice eaten here is a short grain rice. It is uh, sticky rice, so it's easy to pick up with your chopsticks. How did rice get to Japan? Thomas, I think this is right up your alley. I know you love archaeology. This is super cool, and I had no idea, and I'm just, I was so excited when I found this because I'm like, Thomas may have come to the Fukuoka region around 3,000 years ago. There is an archaeological site that Itazuke remains that are in Hakata. And it looks like that's the first evidence of rice grown in Japan. Um, they have the, the different um, sites and even carbonized rice they've unearthed. I didn't realize it was so old. I always assumed maybe only 2,000 years, but mm, 3,000 years, it's longer than I expected. It took about to get to the rest of Japan or most of the rest of Japan, it took about 600 years to cultivate in the different regions. So you have the original area that it was brought over. And then, so maybe you're thinking like if it was closer to 2000 years, it took, it took a little while for it to go up to the different areas. So, okay. So we've got, what is rice? How did it get here? And, you know, we, we got to talk about food because the majority of rice grown is grown for food. Um, some other plants are grown for different purposes, but basically rice is used for food. If you study Japanese, which Thomas, I know you have, the word sagohan, hirugohan, bangohan. What's that? So there are your three different words, or at least one way of saying breakfast, lunch, and dinner time. Hmm. I'm pretty sure I know why you've chosen these three for the episode, but do go on. No, please tell me. I want to know. And well, they all use the 
same ending of gohan um, which means something like meal so you have morning meal midday meal evening meal but i think gohan is also a way of saying rice but no kome is rice so gohan is a different form of rice perhaps yeah you're spot on gohan is the word for cooked rice okay kome or okome so you add the o to make it it's an honorific to make it sound beautiful. That's uncooked rice. So there are different terms for the different stages of rice. Interesting. And yeah, I mean, you know, it, they all have gohan. So your morning rice, your lunch rice, your dinner rice. Essentially, even in the, the language, this, this particular word, it's based on rice. Essentially, you're asking like, you know, have you eaten your morning rice? Is basically what that translates to. Because I suppose, at least historically, before Japan opened up to the West, it was basically that you would have rice would have been your every meal, just with different foodstuffs attached to it at different points in the day. So generally, yes, but not everywhere ate a lot of rice um, towards like the like Edo period and kind of later periods they were eating more rice but pre pre edo i think especially rice was expensive but yeah you're right for many people um it's about the later part of japanese history they were eating a lot of rice so we have rice as food but rice has a part in religion as well so i think you you probably are aware of of this ritual um but using like offering rice to your ancestors the shrines in the house where they'll put like a bit of cooked rice light incense and and to ring a bell the ringing of the bell lets your ancestors know that there is rice waiting for them because there's not food they can get in the afterlife so you're sharing their food to give them something to eat now this is what i was told by the professor and i need to you know probably do a little bit more research but that's my understanding of why you offer the rice i know that's at least in buddhist offerings i think there might be something in shinto but i'm not sure so because sometimes the shinto and buddhist traditions a lot of different places use shinto and buddhist tradition so in this one this is a particular buddhist tradition so we got rice in religion we also have rice in culture so we have rice used in holidays such as like the mochi for new years it's the decorations and it's also in the soup and there's mochi for different seasons such as recently we just ate a pickled sakura leaf mochi so it's a pink mochi with a pickled sakura leaf so it's eaten at springtime which was really good by the way very unusual pickled sakura is the leaf yeah i recommend it it's an interesting flavor and also, I know we've we've mentioned this before on the podcast about the in the moon, we've got the rabbit making the mochi. Now, rice is eaten for food, but it can also make other products. So you have sandals, you have thatched roofing, tatami, and also one of the most famous products for rice. I know you can tell me. What's the most, probably the most famous thing that might come from rice? If we're going to go on about other famous products, then it would have to be sake, yes? Absolutely. Sake is made from rice. Well, nihonshu, technically, because sake means alcohol, and then nihonshu is the specific term. But we all say sake, and we all assume, always think sake is the nihonshu, at least in America. And I think if you say sake here, don't know if people would assume nihonshu or not, but or they might ask, oh, what sake do you like? I know, but I say, oh, I drink sake. Oh, you like you like Japanese sake? Yes, it's very good. It's it's kind of popular in other countries too. So people always get very excited here when you say that you drink sake, which is really cool. I love that. Did you know that there also used to be, there is a special type of drink in Japan also made from rice called doburoku. Ooh, what's that? Doburoku is technically made from rice so also a kind of sake however modern day sake is obviously processed and refined and distilled in such a way that it can gain the name of sake but doburoku is a very old type of sake it's basically an unprocessed type so it's more like really milky and really white and still has some of the rice in it however it can 
only be made in certain towns in Japan that have a special license to brew this traditional type of sake. It's not allowed to actually have the actual name of sake or Nihonshu because it hasn't been processed in the same way. So they use the name Doboroku. And yes, it was actually illegal for quite a long period of time until certain townships wanted to try and bring back the traditional type of unprocessed sake. Oh, so I've seen like the cloudy kind of sake in the stores, but I don't think I don't think I've seen that particular kind. So now I'm I'm kind of going to have to go look for it. Oh, that's super cool. Oh, thank you. Let's let's talk about the money. Let's switch over into and again, I did a, a little bit here for the podcast today and this I think requires its own subject or its own podcast most likely because I think it's safe to say from what you've been telling me there is a hell of a lot of stuff on rice. You could have probably done three or four episodes on the history. So I'm glad that you haven't focused too much on one thing today. And you're kind of giving me and everyone a little quick bit about the different topics to show how widely it was used. So I think it's a good first episode into the subject of rice. So I'm glad you've done it this way. Thank you. Oh, thank you. You're welcome. But yeah, sorry, I interrupted you. So you were going to say rice was used as money? Rice was also used as a payment for taxes. So rice was grown actually for taxation. Uh, lower classes is probably the best way to describe it. I don't like saying lower classes, but the people who are not of high class society might have grown rice, but not actually eaten it. But it was used for taxes. So if you were very rich, you of course ate rice. But if you were very poor, you might not eat rice or you might not eat a lot of it because it was taxes from around the medieval times to the Edo period it was used for taxation and Hideyoshi Toyotomi was responsible for designing the system that evaluated the sizes and yields of rice of the fields in order to evaluate how many of the Bushi class would protect a certain village or a certain area. So essentially, depending on how big your, how many fields you had, how much rice you provided was how much protection you would get for your village. And that was done by the Bushi class. And the Bushi being the samurai, of course. Yeah. I do know recently, not so recent, maybe last year, is it a Seven Samurai? There's a movie where the, the different samurai come to protect the village and the rice planting was a very important part of that movie. If you haven't seen it, I definitely recommend it. It's have you seen it before? I haven't actually. Oh yeah. I definitely recommend that one. We're going to leave currency behind because I just focused on the the tax part because I want to talk a little bit. Well, I guess we're still going to actually be involved with some currency because I'm going to talk about rice consumption in Japan right now. It's gone down in the past several years, several decades. In fact, uh, the introduction and popularity of Western food means that there is a decrease in amount of rice eaten. So people are eating more pasta, eating more bread, which if you eat pasta and bread, you generally don't want to eat rice with it. It's a lot of carbs. <laughs> So you usually focus on just eating a pasta meal. And I mean, I guess you could eat rice and pasta, but that's, I mean, delicious, but too much. Back when I was doing ALT, one of the questions I would ask sometime is, do you, like, what do you eat for breakfast? Do you like rice or bread? And usually in my classrooms, about half the students were eating like bread for breakfast. They weren't always eating rice. A lot of, if they ate breakfast, <laughs> they would usually pick bread, although some did eat rice. Now, because rice is a really important part of Japan, it's also an important part of the economy here. Some places are also trying to bring back the tradition of eating rice because it is an important part of the culture and an important part of like Japanese food. There was an article about 2015. There is a shrine that created a specific rice dish called Nagashi Gohan which is rice with azuki, which is the red beans, and millet topped with kakiyage, which is like a deep fried vegetable, almost like a, almost like a little cake. This, this, the shape is kind of round. It's really good, by the way. And then they seasoned it with ginger sauce. So some places are trying to 
highlight rice as an important part of like a culture or a festival to you know, bring back that awareness of, hey, don't forget about rice. It's really good. And I really want to try that. <laughs> it sounds so good. It does sound very tasty, actually. So speaking of eating rice, Thomas, you said you don't cook rice so often, but how do you cook rice when you do it? You would use a rice cooker. Okay. Yeah, here, like most people use a rice cooker, but did you ever like, like use your stovetop like back in the UK? When I was in England, I would. Yeah. Use the stovetop, yeah. But since coming here, like, it's much cheaper here to buy a rice cooker because it's the norm as opposed to buying one in England. Now, can you tell a difference in the rice cooked in the rice cooker and in the pot? I prefer the stuff from the rice cooker. It seems like it's cooked better. It's more evenly cooked. It's softer as well. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you. The, the taste is... It, it tastes better to me in the rice cooker. Um, there's different types of rice cookers, which we will not go into. <laughs> yeah, here, usually people are, are using rice cookers. You can use a stovetop and boil it. You can also steam rice, which you'll see a lot like when you make mochi, because mochi has a specific type of rice, and mochi rice, which is even more sticky. You steam it before you start pounding it. When you make rice, what do you do? Like, do you just put it in the rice cooker with some water and push the button or do you do anything before there are people who would wash it before i don't tend to do that but you can i'm not sure what it it gets something off it like what does it do please tell me i'm not actually sure rinsing the rice so if you rinse rice it removes a lot of starch and it also any debris like they're they, they process rice pretty well here but sometimes there can be like a little stick or a little rock, a little dirt that might get in your rice. I mean, usually the processed rice doesn't have that, but it can. And you do not want to have a little rock when you're taking a bite of your rice. That kind of hurts and can break your teeth and cause dental problems. Also, it improves the flavor. And and at least in my opinion, um, like if I don't rinse my rice well enough, I can sort of tell, like it doesn't taste quite as good. So I would definitely challenge you to rinse your rice. Now, You can in Japan, I don't remember in America, but you can buy pre-rinsed rice that you don't have to wash, but the unrinsed rice tastes better. So I've bought both. I've bought the pre-washed and the not washed and like the flavor is, is a little better to me. Now, if you don't want to do the washing, just look for the uh, already washed rice. You just pop it in, hit the button. Rinse the rice, you want to kind of rinse it until the water becomes clear. The first time you rinse it, you'll notice it's really, really white. It looks kind of like that, the cloudy sake. But yeah, rinse it till it becomes clear. And when you put it in the rice cooker or in the stovetop, if you're going to cook it in more like well, how we eat it here, no seasoning, no salt, no oil, no butter if you're going to eat it just with your meal. Now there are different ways to cook rice. So there's different um, methods that do include some seasoning, but that's for another podcast. For just your basic meal, you don't want anything in it because you want to eat the rice with with sides. So in Japan, you have rice is the main part. Then you have like a protein, you have different pickles, you have side dishes. So you'll eat lots of different foods and the rice helps kind of cleanse your palate. It also provides a backdrop for different flavors. So you can essentially feel like you're eating a lot of different things while you're eating the rice. So that's, it's pretty fun. You can get a lot of different flavors for that. Rice is also here served in a separate bowl. You don't put everything on a plate here. Everything is in a separate bowl. And I'm going to, I'm going to just ask you a question, but feel free to interject at any point. Do you know of any particular manners regarding eating rice? I know of the don't put your chopsticks in them so they stand up right because that is reminiscent of graves but I'm not sure how it's reminiscent of graves. You're right putting the rice the chopsticks standing up in the rice is what you'll do for funeral rites so when you are at the funeral preparing the the recently departed for the afterlife you will have that bowl of rice with the chopstick standing up so if you put your chopstick standing up you're going to make people think of funerals which might not be the best thing to do at a meal. You know, maybe just a recommendation. (laughs) Well, there is one other thing that's a good habit to do, and that is to finish all of your rice. So in some cultures, there is 
different way to kind of show respect for the food and show respect for the cook. Um, some cultures leave some food. Japan is a culture that finishes all the plates, especially the rice, because it can be seen as maybe a little disrespectful and rude to not finish the rice, especially, you know, we do have like before you eat your, your food, you say itadakimasu and then gochito sama deshita after to show respect for the food, show respect for for the cook as well. So not finishing, especially your rice, can be considered like rude or even like motenai. So like, like a waste, like wasting food, which, you know, food's important, especially back several years ago when rice was very expensive. I mean, to not finish something that was expensive would have been wasting money. So disrespecting and wasting Definitely, you want to finish all of your food here. Now, if you can't finish it because it's too much food, that's different. Don't make yourself sick, but try to finish your food if you can. Okay. Whew. So that is a little bit about, a lot about rice, but I wanted to also bring some folk tales because I always, I always love when you bring in folk tales about a historical topic. So I got a couple for you today. The first one is the rolling rice ball. And uh, so what's a, what, I feel like I keep asking you questions. So what's a rice ball, Thomas? A rice ball would be basically taking all your rice and forming it together into a shape of a ball, like onigiri, I suppose. That's right. So we have, I think there's different shapes for onigiri. So there's the triangular shape, but I have seen like, there are round onigiri too. You've seen them at the, the convenience stores. For the purposes of our story, this is a round actual rice ball. Mukashi Mukashi, there is an oji son who went to work on the top of a mountain, bringing with him his wife's delicious rice balls. Well, when lunchtime came, oji san eagerly reached into his bag and pulled one out. Well, wouldn't you know it, but one of those rice balls escaped and rolled down into a hole. The oji san was quite hungry, so he decided he had to get that rice ball and follow the trail. When he got there, he looked inside the hole, and there were happy and rejoicing mice. Oh, dear sir, thank you so much for this glorious food. You are our hero. And with that, the mice danced and sang. The oji san, hungry but happy that the mice were so happy, decided to let them keep part of his lunch. Oh, but please, before you go, we want to give you a gift. You can choose the small box or the big box. Well, the oji san, probably very wisely, because maybe a big box was heavy to carry home, decided to take the small box. And the mice gave him the small box, and the man returned to finish his lunch. When he arrived home, he opened the box, and all sorts of treasures burst forth. The oji san and his wife, greatly pleased with their new windfall, decided to share this with the town. And there was much rejoicing. Well, except for one man the oji-san's neighbor. He was very jealous, and he decided that he needed to get a box for himself, just for himself. So he found out how the oji-san got the box and went the same route. He journeyed to the mouse's hole and dropped in the rice ball. When he started to hear the sounds of rejoicing, he looked inside. You mice, I gave you a rice ball, so give me a gift or I'm bringing my cat. The shocked mice, really disturbed by this angry man, dragged him into their hole. And with that, the angry neighbor was never seen again. How big are these mice to drag a full-grown man into their hole? I was wondering that too. Now, another version of this story I saw did say that the mice chased him away. And also that the neighbor's wife hit the man on the head with a stick. So there are different endings to the story. But this particular version based on on where I got different the, the different sources seem to prefer the more violent ending. I mean, I prefer the not as violent ending, but I, I kept it for the purposes of this story. But yeah, I'm wondering about how big that hole was. You said there was a couple of folktales, so you have another one? I do indeed. And this one I'm going to give you a little bit of history about, and I'm pretty excited about it. This is a folktale that was written in the Bingo Fudoki from the 8th century. And I did say bingo. It's not the song. It is the name for a particular region in the Hiroshima prefecture and one I am familiar with. So I know this area. And um, it was previously this particular area in Hiroshima used to be called bingo. Now, 
This folk tale has several shrines that are have charms that are based on this particular folk tale, and it's called Somin Shorai. Mukashi Mukashi. Somin Shorai was very poor, but very kind. He was always willing to lend a hand to those less fortunate. One day, while taking a journey, he happened across a man who seemed lost, tired, and dirty. Ah! Solman came up to the traveler. Are you lost? Oh, I'm a visitor here, but I have. I've gotten lost, and I'm trying to find a place to stay. I'm so tired, and I'm so hungry, said the man. Well, I don't have much, but please, share my lunch with me. It's millet and rice. I'm sorry it's so humble, but it is very filling. Ah, oh, thank you. And with that, the man took a bite, but he stopped. And while Solman looked on, his appearance changed. He was actually a deity in disguise. Solman, your kindness in helping an unknown traveler should be rewarded. I'm gifting you this ring, which will save you from harm. Guard it well. And with that, the deity disappeared. Much later, a terrible wind came and destroyed much of Solman's home village. However, Solman and his family were saved because of the ring given to him by the deity. Now, with... There are a few different versions I did see for this story. One said it was a charm. One did not have the ending where the, the misfortune happened to the villages and he was saved. So I've taken a little bit from a couple of different sources. Um, I do have the sources for a couple of the folk tales. So I, I did kind of make one based on a couple of different sources. But what do you think? It's a very short one. I like it though. It, it it um again is coming kind of links back to the oni and that you have gods and deities who are disguising themselves as kind of a because they're there as like a secret form of blessing hmm. i also think that like you were saying like in the past when potentially rice was more difficult and more expensive something you shouldn't waste for them to actually demonstrate that even though something can be expensive and it can be difficult to come across, you should still share it with those in need. So it's kind of a good a good life lesson on how you should act to other people who are in need. Oh, well, yeah. I, I like that. I mean, something that kind of this story reminded me a little bit was the story of the Good Samaritan. When I was reading, especially kind of the beginning, where in another version of the story, the deity was rejected like people refused to help him until Solomon came so with that particular version i was reminded of the the good samaritan so that was also really interesting to get the perspective of like a you know a story from an, another time period and another different culture so some of the similarities and not just that but the previous folk tale there's actually um some basis in russian folklore for the rolling rice ball so we have two different folk tales that still seem to tie into different places in the world uh, and stories from different places in the world. So it's almost like these stories spread to other countries or they were based off of information gathered from other countries brought into Japan and they were just changed and adapted over time. Could be or something else that might be interesting is just there's a lot of similarities in different cultures in the world so maybe you know even like the the origin story of um that we've come up with the the origin of japan similarities to tales from other countries now they could be influenced by other countries or did these countries come up with the similar stories on their own which i i like it makes the world definitely connected in different ways and i i quite love that i guess you're right there there is the fact that you could say they're all based off of one another through the passing of stories but yeah you could also say that perhaps different cultures just tried to be just tried to teach people the same message that they should look after people and so their stories always ended up being similar in some form because at the end of the day people just want to be good if they can i do like the way you put that that's quite that's quite lovely oh thank you well that's i think all for for my portion for today unless you have any other questions and if you don't please take it away i have no questions today i know i gave a lot of thoughts today about the stuff you've said and you also asked me a lot of questions which was nice but i guess now you want me to 
head over to the literature corner. Absolutely. I'm so excited to see what poem you've picked today. So I picked someone today called Kensho, or as he's also known by others as Master Kensho. We're uncertain of the dates in which he lived, although people think it's likely to have been around 1130 until around 1209. So even though it's uncertain, these are quite specific dates, I find, but there we go. Uh, Though we don't really know who his parents actually were, we do know that he was at some point whether in childhood or slightly later, adopted by one of the members of the Fujiwara clan, and in particular, a man known as Fujiwara no Akisuke. And Akisuke, interestingly, has got his own poem, which we can find in the Ogura Hyakuin issue, which we talked about a lot. But for Master Kensho, today's poem comes actually from a poetry competition. Oh! A poetry competition in 600 rounds, and that in Japan, Japanese would have been known as the Ropiakuban Uta Awase. We do know that in his life, Kensho acted as judge in similar poetry competitions. These competitions in particular consisted basically of two poems being read side by side with a judge ruling which of the two best fit the theme that they were writing about. Now, I'm actually unsure who judged Kensho's poem during this competition that I'm going to read today. But Kensho's poem did fit into the category of love, and he was up against another member of the Fujiwara clan, a Fujiwara no Tsuneie. And this man was actually the minister for the imperial household. Do you have your pen and paper ready? Why, yes, I do. So I will endeavor to read this as best I can. Okay. Fukoto wa nawashiro mizu wo hikitomei. I, I heard mizu, so water, and I thought I heard toshio, like old, and uh, there's something dama, dama, like oya dama. Um, like it's not parents, is it? Okay, give me the translation. I'm, I'm bowing out today. <laughs> Okay, I did pick a bit of a challenging one today. I do apologize. But like I said, I wanted to try and find one that relates to rice. Mm -hmm. And funnily enough, I came across a love poem. So the English for this would be, Can a meeting like the waters around the rice seedlings be stopped in their endless flow past the Oyamada barrier? Ah, so, okay, stopped was in there. So that's... Oh... Now, I tried desperately to find out what the Oyamada barrier could possibly be, and I actually didn't find any definitive answer. I just kept finding that we're unsure what this is. But from the context, I kind of assume it's maybe a river mouth or something, like the constant flow of water from a river into the ocean. Yeah, that would make sense because they... Usually for like the the rice paddies, they'll divert water from. That's why you, you have a lot of you new know, civilizations near the the rivers because they need that water to supply for the rice paddy. Not civilizations. You have villages and towns here a lot of times near the river because you would need to have that water for your rice paddies. So maybe it's an old name for a river or some kind of body of water, like a lake or something, or in particular, maybe it was a, a man-made body of water for the rice paddies. That's my conjecture. Okay. Oh, so essentially because the, the water in the fields is standing and still they want to stop and be like the grass, like the rice grass, <laughs> being able to stay in that moment for a long period of time. That's what I gathered from it. Mm-hmm. Oh, I, I do like that. It's, I mean, considering, I mean, I think, like we said before, like like the rice paddies are quite beautiful here when the, when the waters are just kind of steady and still and the, the rice is growing. It's so lovely. So that, that imagery itself, like the, the beauty of, I think the rice paddies are gorgeous. To kind of think of that as a romantic idea is, that's quite nice. I'm glad you think so. One final thing, though, to add. Unfortunately, Kensho did not win with this poem. He lost to Fujiwara no Tsuneye. And the judge's critique 
did stay did state though that his poem was stylistically tasteful but actually the line which we translate as can a meeting like the waters round the rice seedlings the judge actually felt that this gave a very weak conception of love which is why he unfortunately did not win the love poem i'm guessing he's not a fan of the beauty of the rice patty <laughs> I wanted to know the poem that won. I can read you the poem that won if you wish. Oh, go, go. Koromo de wa kiyomi ga seki ni arane domo tayuru yo mo naki namida narikeri. Okay, and what's the translation? So the translation would be, My sleeves as the barrier at kiyomi are not yet without cease are my tears. Well, personally, I, I like the, the rice seedlings because I'm not confident. I know much about sleeve. I know they're very important, but I don't have much context for the knowledge. But I do know about rice seedlings, especially after researching. I think I think I like Kinshaw's poem. It's, I feel that sleeves, have, it's come up in a few of your poems before the concept of leaves and things. I do think they were used as a form of stylistic imagery for crying. So even if someone is not expressly said said to have been crying like if they said like mist gathers upon my sleeves even because they mentioned water and sleeves together it gives the interpretation of crying, crying. Mm -hmm. but i actually do prefer as well the rice seedlings one i kind of understand it a bit more mm. but maybe that's purely because something is lost in translation into the english could be or maybe you just had to be there during that time period <laughs> Perhaps you did. But yeah, there you go. There is the poem. Well, I suppose two poems now for today. I do hope you enjoyed them. Yes, I love that. Thank you for finding that. And it's a poetry competition, which I have touched on in my research. But um, I'm, I'm glad to have a little bit more, more knowledge about that. So awesome. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, so that's all of my stuff out the way today. We didn't do a book recommendation last week, but I was wondering if you wish to give one this week as this is your episode. Yeah, and I think it's it's my turn since you did the last one. Absolutely, I would love to. I'm going to do the recommendation, which is the... I feel like you've heard this several times. So now I'm going to recommend to you 100 poets, one poet each. There are some different versions out there. The one I have is a penguin. It's one of the Penguin Classics. It contains the... So it has the, the English translation of the poem, as well as pictures, and it also has the Romanji. So while it doesn't have the kanji, which, well, to be honest, you and I are not to the point we can read that yet anyway, because it's a lot of older kanji, but it does have the Romanji, so you can see the, the Japanese. Now, if you know hiragana and katakana, well, you probably just have hiragana, but you can put the romanji into hiragana if you wish. But if you are not familiar with hiragana and katakana, it's helpful so that you can actually read the Japanese. It also has history about the poems and the poets. So you'll get some background and some of the things that we've talked about before. You can see them in writing. And it's a, it's a lovely book. Very great cover to picture, which very interesting, interestingly enough, has the title of in a little while things will get much better that's what i'm going to leave you with today i will leave you with that today okay thank you for the recommendation i definitely agree with the recommendation i think that's one of the few books we both own because we refer to it quite a lot um so yeah i would also definitely recommend it so what are we gonna do next week that's the thing if i'm honest guys as of right now I'm not too sure. Next week, I did want to do a bit of cherry blossom history. However, last weekend, they discouraged travel around Japan. So I could not get to Tokyo to get to the bookstore to get the book that I needed to do the research. Perhaps I can get it in time from Amazon. But if not, we may change it up. So you will either end up with history of the cherry blossoms or you are going to actually get the first episode about Ainu history and we will cover one of the folk tales of the Ainu people from northern Japan. Uh, but that's everything for me for today. What about you, Heather? I th I think that's going to do it for me. Um, I do want to say thank you again to everyone for listening. And we are hope you are doing well and keeping safe. We are thinking of you and sending 
all of our best wishes and best hopes. And we will hopefully keep on recording for you guys and give you something interesting and informative to listen to. So, again, that's everything from me. So I'm going to sign off. Again, thank you all for listening. Mata ne! Minasan, kiyotsukete. Mata ne! If you've enjoyed the Japan archives, please consider checking out historyofjapan.co.uk, a database we are making on Japanese history. You can also find the show notes for all our episodes here. If you're on Instagram, you can follow my account over at nexus underscore travels. That's N E X U S underscore travels. We also have a Facebook and Twitter page, which you can find at Japan Archives. If you're interested in little slices of life in Japan, be sure to check out my website over at heatheroveryonder.com. Thank you for tuning in today. We hope you enjoyed the episode. And if you have any suggestions for future episodes, have anything you'd love to hear about, head on over to historyofjapan.co.uk and send us a message. If you enjoyed the show, please be sure to give us a rating and review over on iTunes. Thank you again for listening, guys. Until next time, bye. Matane!